Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you to bring you God's Word on Pentecost Sunday. And you've heard a lot about it already. That's the event that happened after Jesus ascended into heaven. And uh, the disciples were all gathered together 10 days later in Jerusalem. And Joel the prophet had promised it. And the Holy Spirit came in a miraculous way. And lo and behold, our sermon text today is from Genesis chapter 11. What? I didn't pick it, but I picked to preach on it. The church fathers, many decades ago, picked Genesis 11 to be read as the Old Testament reading on Pentecost Sunday because it's like the other bookend. You know, the, all the events of Christ's life were finished with that ascension into heaven on earth, and now he was turning over to the church the good news, and he told the disciples to wait until the Holy Spirit came because they couldn't even get the story right, nor would they have the boldness and the clarity to preach and teach the good news about Jesus until the Holy Spirit came, which is Pentecost. But at Pentecost, the people they were preaching to did not all speak the same language. Have you ever traveled across Europe? Gone from country to country? Stood there in the airport at Frankfurt and you can't really read the sign the lights or scared driving down the highway because you don't know what that exit's all about or been on the aisle of a grocery store here in Texas and heard three different languages, right? Imagine trying to share the most important message of all and there's a language barrier. Just ask Pastor Dan about that. He's working in English, but then the English on the other end isn't really the same English always that we have. What's this all about? What's the connection between Babel, the Tower of Babel, and Pentecost? Well, you, you know it has to do with languages, don't you? I would say that Genesis 11 is one of the most disregarded places in Scripture to the demise of understanding societal problems and their origin. And I get it that the world doesn't get it because they listen to this story and they go, ah, that's got a miracle in it, it's just a fairy tale. But I don't get it when Christians don't get it. And that's why I hope to preach to you this morning clarity from Genesis chapter 11 that you understand both the origin of societal's ills between race and people and families and genders and then you understand the great beautiful solution is all, what it's always been the good news of Jesus Christ is the solution and God knew it all along so let me set the scene for you for Genesis 11 there was Adam and Eve right in Genesis 1 and then their descendants got so far off track that the entire human race was going to be lost to unbelief. There were only eight people left that had a shred of knowledge of God. So God floated them away from everybody else. And he saved humanity from being totally lost in the darkness of unbelief. He saved Noah and his family. When Noah and his family got out of the ark, God told them, spread out, procreate, and fill the earth. With, and, and when you go, you fill the earth with the knowledge of me, the great promising creator, savior, sanctifier, who's going to send a redeemer someday. And when they spread out, and that's all in chapter 10 about how the family spread out, the way that Moses organizes things is he, he, he finishes a thought in detail and then he backtracks in chronology to tell you some facts about the thought. Like Genesis 1, Creating the world in six days, Adam and Eve are created at the end of Genesis 1. But Genesis 2 is the expanded story about the creation of Eve, right? It's not good for man to be alone. He backtracks. Genesis 10, well, this is Japheth's, these are the sons of Noah. Japheth's descendants who went up to Europe. These are Shem's who went to the central part of the world. These are uh, the other sons, and he, they went that way to the east. I'm, for the moment, it escapes me. It's not Ham because he's the descendant of one of them. But you know, you know what I'm talking about. So, why did they spread out? 
Well, they actually weren't going to. That's Genesis 11. They weren't going to. God made them spread out. And this is the part that I want you to know, dear Christian friends, that so many Christians disregard, don't listen to, don't factor it in when they're listening to the news about societal problems and the, the, the battle between countries Languages, peoples, races, genders, and all those things. But you're going to factor it in because you're listening to the Holy Word of God. And Pentecost is going to factor in even larger than the story. So let's go to it. It's Genesis chapter 11. There was a problem in humanity that's very common, and it runs deep in the heart of everyone since Adam and Eve decided they could, re they could eat from the tree themselves and be wise. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, remember the ark was somewhere on the mountains of Ararat, so up in Turkey. So as they moved eastward from there, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. This is where modern day Iraq is. It's the plain between the Tigris and Euphrates River. It's Babylon in the days of the Bible. They found a plain in Shinar and they settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. couple big things to notice. One, you wouldn't really know without doing the work just to read around at what people have studied about the historical setting. Baking bricks in a kiln or in a, even a primitive kiln was not something that was as common. They had discovered in these, as the, their technology advanced, that they could make better, more beautiful, more, more solid, bricks by kilning them, not just sun baking them out in the sun. And when they said, let's make a city for ourselves, undoubtedly, because all over the place there are ruins from that era, it was with a city wall around it. And most of the little cities had some kind of tower in them. They weren't being entirely apart from their culture. But this is the beginning of that kind of thinking after Noah and his family got off the ark. And what did I tell you that God had told Noah and his family? Spread out and fill the earth. They weren't wanting to spread out and fill the earth. They wanted to settle down. They wanted to make a name for themselves and they wanted comfort. When God calls for us to live for him, usually seeking comfort based on our own wisdom is not in the equation. Seeking comfort in him and his promises and trusting him and going on the pilgrimage that he gives you puts us on the great adventure with God. They were having none of that. All human ventures apart from faith in God end up in an atheistic humanistic-centered venture. And it was all about them as the human race. And it seems innocent enough. This is what's kind of powerful and beautiful about this story. It seems innocent enough because this isn't about rape, murder, right? Exploitation of other people, human trafficking. It's building a city and living in it. And taking care of your families. It's like the Declaration of Independence. It's the divine right for what? The pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? So this is good stuff. God. No, it's not good stuff. Because it wasn't my plan for you. And it doesn't factor God in at all. It's all about you. This is the law, what I'm teaching you, that God is showing us in this story for us, quote, good people, end quote. 
Because even good people are sinful, self-centered, self-absorbed people who want to either make a name for themselves or to avoid making a bad name for themselves. And we all have it as humans. And at the very rudiment of society, of society when there was only one family and it was growing into a, now a tribe, they were expressing it very rapidly, just like Cain had in the family of Adam and Eve. And we all have it. So let's just, for a moment, use that we all have it as an illustration. I have a little treasure box at home. I have, it. I have this disease, too, where I want to make a name for myself. I, you do also. I just don't know if you're willing to stand up here and admit it yet. But I have a little treasure box with coins and things that my parents gave me. My, I, at my Lutheran church, you got a, a little medal every year for perfect attendance in Sunday school. And, and so I got this medal with the Luther seal, and then underneath it are all these bars, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. I got a little, little bitty article. Today I have to use my glasses for sure to read it. The print is just tiny, tiny. From the back of the Garland Daily News that says... 55-yard run, TD, Donald Patterson. <laughs> My name was in the paper. The only touchdown I ever made in Little League football. <laughs> Saved it. Still know where it is. I could preach about it up here. Next to that, wouldn't fit in my old treasure box. I had the only home run ball with all my teammates when I was 10 years old. The only one that I knocked over the fence. I'm 59 years old. I don't want to lose that ball. I made a name that day for myself. <laughs> Here's a better one. This is really funny. When one of our boys played high school football, every now and then the Round Rock leader, by the way, newspapers know this. If they put your names in the paper, you'll buy their newspapers. I read that in an article about making things sticky. Newspapers that really work are the ones that put a whole birthdays, and obituaries, and kids, and girls playing volleyball, and whatever, right? So... The Round Rock leader, you know, comes, came out every Saturday morning. I'd go get my coffee at Starbucks, and I'd go over to the 7-Eleven or the Valera station there in Round Rock, and I'd look to see during football season if they covered my son's football game. I mean, maybe his name's in there somewhere. Maybe a picture, right? I remember one time somebody called me and said, hey, he's in the Round Rock leader this morning, and I went over there, and they were sold out. <laughs> what happened, I said. She said, some guy came in here and bought five or eight copies. Later, I was talking to Mark Finsky. His son played the same year, different high school. He said, yeah, I went over to the Valero and I bought all five copies they had. <laughs> I was so mad at him. Well, let me buy one of yours. <laughs> Make a name, right? Make a name. Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is, right? Let's make a name for ourselves. A few years ago got to go to Rome. I was amazed at how intoxicated the Italians were with making names for themselves. First of all, all the Roman emperors who have the forums that are in their ruins, one right after another. But then, it, then once the church took over in Rome, you've got dead bodies everywhere under glass. You have statues in churches of different popes, people I've never ever heard of or studied in history and were not significant to us. But there's this like 20 foot statue of this guy. What was he thinking? Making a name. And even you, dear Christians, sometimes sit around and think, will anybody remember who I am two generations? And then you can get depressed if you think not. And some of these, even these uh, twisted criminal minds that do the um, mass shootings are making a name for themselves. But sometimes it's in innocuous ways, right, to us, and other times it's in evil ways, right? And God said it all smacks of hell. It's all dark. It's all humanistic. It's all man-centered. But he loves us. When he saw with Noah that it was going to take the last family out, then he folded up the game board and said, if you're not going to make a name for me, you're going to make it for yourselves. Because my name saves everybody, your name doesn't. He folded up the board and flooded the earth. But not this time. Not right after he had flooded the earth. 
but he flooded again. This time he did something different. He messed with our nest. He came down and saw what they were doing, and look what it says. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower and the people were building. And he said, if, as one people speaking the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. They'll just keep building a world that is out of hum humanity and society that keeps drifting everybody away from God, the creator and redeemer. The one who's preparing a place in heaven for us. Come, let us go down. What do you think the us is? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Best guess. Let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Wait a minute. God decided there'd be different languages to make a mess? Yeah. If you get hung up on the simple and the miraculous of the story, you will forever be spiritually in the dark. If you don't factor in, in childlike faith, that this is really what happened in a moment, just like at Pentecost, in a moment, Peter and the boys could speak all those languages, God could change all those languages in a moment. He who created Adam out of dust and Eve from a rib and everything in six nanoseconds spread way out over six days, can change the languages of people in a moment. He's the supernatural, all-powerful being. And the only reason he put it in print is so we would be enlightened and understand what is this world that we live in that has societal challenges of the different governments, different geographies, different races of people that seem to never be able to get world peace. Headline. God doesn't want us to have world peace. He wants us to have Jesus' peace. And how could we have world peace since Adam and Eve fell into sin and we're all going to die because we're their children who are sinners after them? Do you understand how naive it is to think that world peace is God's biggest goal? It's where the peace of the good news of God's love goes. That's what Pentecost is about that brings that, that world peace. So God changed their languages. Well, immediately they begin, languages are how you organize your thoughts and your culture. Everything is kind of plays into it. And so they, they look at life different ways. They say things different ways. They understand things di with different sounds. And immediately there's this complete breakdown. Exactly what God wanted to stop the humanistic, man-centered plan to have heaven on earth. So verse 8. So the Lord scattered them all, all over from there, all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. And that is why it's called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Remember what he had told Noah? Scatter over the face of the whole earth. And they wouldn't. So he made them. He scattered them anyway. Over the face of the whole earth. Uh, if you would go to slide four, Megan. There's that verse I keep quoting. God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Now I'm showing you from Psalm 113, which comes later in the Bible, but it's the heart of God. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the place that it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. What's God's goal for humanity? That anywhere he would come down on the earth, there would be people who are spreading the knowledge of God, who are speaking accurately in his name, who are leading others to trust in his love and his plan and his savior, who are worshiping from a heart of thanks and not a heart of trying to earn his favor. There God wants his name. What's his name? This is an interesting little sidebar on this whole story of Babel. 
Back and forth in Genesis and also the other f- first five books of the Bible, the authors use either the word God or Lord, but in their language it was Elohim or Yahweh. And it was much more specific to them when they heard it in their ear. This is a language study moment. And so when an author uses Elohim, it's Almighty God or God, 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 God. He is emphasizing with the nuance and the name that he uses a little different thought than when he uses Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. When Moses was at the burning bush and he said, well, who do I tell them sent me so they'll believe you really sent me? He said, I am that I am, which is Yahweh, Yahweh. I am the, the, the independent God of free and faithful grace. Well, here in this story, if you look, everywhere it's all capital letters, L-O-R-D, it's Yahweh. So the, Yahweh went down, Yahweh went down, Yahweh went down, not God Almighty, but the same God. But the nuance is he's, on, he's in patience mode, Savior mode, and this is Yahweh, and guess what the name is? Jesus or Jesus means Yahweh saves. So this is God with the gospel in his heart, thinking of Pentecost someday, frustrating the languages, separating the race so they couldn't, they scattered because they couldn't understand each other. They found people they could understand and they scattered and the gene pool of humanity got separated so they weren't constantly cross-marrying and keep remixing the gene pool, and with the gene pool separating and languages being different, culture, many different cultures were developed. Race was developed. All the ver- varieties that we categorize, sometimes in our own like street smart kind of way and sometimes in a scholarly way, they are categorized by God as he moved people out in different places. Loves them all the same. That's why he scattered us, because he loves us all the same. And here we sit in our little race and our little culture and we look across the fence and we think somehow because we're so egocentric, because our race is so familiar to us and we can think of all the virtues of our race, that somehow he got to love us more. We don't want to say it, but we think it. And God says, no, I scattered you all so you would constantly be needing to look up and not here or there to find God. You're not gods. You can't do everything you ever wanted. Make yourself live forever in a comfortable world on this earth. You're on your way out. The ship is going down. You need to look up and find me. And I'm the Savior God who loves you and redeemed you. So let's put it in our context. Have you gone to the gas pump, whether you're right or not, have you gone to the gas pump and paid that $4.30 a gallon and thought, that Putin? Or something like that? You see, you are painfully aware that world events and cultural events are here to plague you for the rest of your life. But wasn't there a time when we thought maybe World War II would not be repeated? And now millions in Ukraine are being displaced, exploited, raped and pillaged and relocated just like the Assyrians did in Jesus' day, before Jesus' day. And they're moving them to the farthest part of Russia so that they can never culturally be Ukrainian again. And imagine the pain they're feeling. It's not 4.30 at the gas pump, right? And we hear all this, and the reason I'm bringing all this up is that we hear all this, and you're plagued by it, and I'm one of your pastors, and I want you to uh, sit at Peter's feet at Pentecost with an enlightened mind. Going, I hope you were going to get to Pentecost sooner or later. So there's Israel. Genesis is the beginning of the Bible. There's Israel, one little people group out of all of the thousands of people groups that God has created who have held the gospel promises that he keeps giving through their prophets. And then their Savior comes, but they're thinking the Savior was just for the Jews, but he's not. Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes. He'll enlighten you how this gospel is for all people. And then 
the, the Holy Spirit comes, and Peter goes, I got it! Jesus was crucified for all people. Everyone. This is what the story of empty nets and full nets and you'll be fishers of men was about. This is, I got it. I got it. And all these people are coming for Pentecost back to the Jerusalem. There's a temple in the middle. It's got, it occupies most of the city on the, on the east side. And pushed by God and able. He, you know, this is a cultural thing that until you read the story of Pentecost, really none of us think about it very often. And all the stories of Jesus in the temple teaching people, you, you don't hear about it. But you do at Pentecost. Judaism was so old that there were so many Jews of other races of people, religiously Jews, or Jews that had been raised in those other countries, that their mother tongue was not Hebrew. Hebrew was more like the Latin of Europe at the time of, G of, of Peter and Jesus. So you would be a Jew, maybe even blood, but maybe not. It says in the, t the story that Caleb read, a proselytes to Judaism. So people of other races, but they turned Jewish religiously. But you didn't know Hebrew. So you go to the temple, and it was like the, uh, for many centuries, what um, Westerners would do when they'd go to the Catholic Church, and it was all in Latin, but they really didn't speak Latin. You were there to go through the motions because you were a respectful, believing Jew, but you didn't really understand everything that's going on. Peter's part of that culture. Peter's got Jesus. He died. He rose again. All sins of all people are forgiven. He rose from the dead. We're all dying, but we're going to go, we're going to rise again someday. Our soul and our bodies are going to come back together. We're going to live forever. I got to get the word out. Oh. Everybody that comes here has a different language. So he opens his mouth, and so do the other 11. And he, when he speaks, he's completely in cultural harmony. He's completely in racial harmony. He's completely in language harmony with the person he's talking to. And he has a motive that's completely pure for them, and they have a motive that's completely pure in listening, and he tells them about their Savior. Not about the stock market. Not about the Republicans or the Democrats. Not about the whites or the blacks. He tells them about Jesus. And suddenly they feel and believe that God has included them he, they know he's a Galilean, they can tell, has included them in the eternal plan to save humanity that was wrecked when Adam and Eve fell into sin. Way back before Babel. Babel is completely reversed. The speaker, Peter and the boys, they all speak the languages of the people. And the, uh, if you read the list that Caleb read us, there's at least 15 languages represented there. They're, they're speaking and everyone's coming together around the good news that God loves us. Stinkers that we are, he loves us. He forgives us. There's no sin in this room that's so big that we should all turn on you and judge you. Because God forgave it all. And we all, they all got that understanding and they're like, what is this? That's what, how that reading ends. What is this? We're all here, the wonders of God in our own language. The wonders of who? Remember Babel? Who were they going to make a name for? Themselves. And God thought, oh man, you might find your name in the paper, but it's worthless. <laughs> make a name for me, and I will save everybody. Make a name for me. And so he sent Peter and the, the guys out from there, and he sends the church for 2,000 years with the Great Commission, go and make followers of me from what? All nations. You're hearing in those monumental passages, you're hearing the heart of God. Make a name for me and my love and among all nations. 
not just your own. And the highest, this is the thing for Christians, and you're, I'm preaching to Christians. There's very few, maybe not one unbeliever in this room. The highest calling for every Christian is to give the wonders of God to people that you can in this generation before you're no longer here. To reach across every wall, every line, every situation, and bring the wonders of God to them. It is not about you, dear person, and it's not about me. It's about making a name for God. We call that pilgrimage. And they wanted to make a city for themselves. Remember that? And the city would be a place of comfort. A house. You know, Peter and the guys, Jesus, modeled it for them. They were missionaries. You and I are not necessarily missionaries in the sense that we live like a nomadic life geographically. We, we all have an address, right? Majority of us in this room are owners of the address. Doesn't matter if we're not. We all have a spot. We all have a space. We make it our own, right? But it's really important, especially in American culture, that we recognize that isn't really God's goal, although it might have been the Declaration of Independence goal for Americans. It's not God's goal for the Christian that your highest pursuit in life is the pursuit of your rights and your happiness. Your highest pursuit is for God's name and souls. Only the word of God and souls last forever. And your highest sense of joy and satisfaction and meaning and value will be, if you're in sync with what the Spirit is teaching you, will be when you are part of the spiritual preservation and salvation of souls. Your children, your friends, your acquaintances, your church, fellow church members. When you know you're in the center of God's heart, the one that looked down and said, it's just not about your names, and you're about God's name, and you are encouraging and sharing, then you'll have the greatest sense of spiritual satisfaction. Even if you're a slave, it says in 1 Corinthians 7. April 12th marked 110 years since the sinking of the Titanic, where 1,504 people died. I want you to imagine for a minute that you are a shipmate, one of the, the men working for the Titanic, and the, the captain and his, his right-hand man are in the, the head where the, the, their headquarters is in the ship, and they know they've hit the iceberg and they know that the ship is sinking they call you in and they tell you you have three things to do first of all you go to every person you can on the ship and everywhere in the ship every corner nook and cranny and you tell them you go to them secondly you tell them the ship is sinking we are sinking do you know that that one of the reason why they had so many deaths is that they had so many people that didn't think the ship was going to sink yeah it's not a secret right it's hard to convince people that the ship is sinking. Try to tell them the world's going to end. Yeah, bleh, they've been saying that forever. You're just one of those preachers, right? Ship is sinking, and then the lifeboats are ready. Get to the lifeboats. That's your job. So you leave the, the headquarters, and you run down the hall, and just then you're hit by the pangs of hunger, and there's a line right there for the buffet, and you get in line. It takes 20 minutes to get through the line, 10 minutes to eat, 30 minutes are gone, but now you feel better, so you're ready to go do it. And you go down the hallway a little way, and there's a bunch of men standing in line for the bathroom, and that makes you have to go. So you get in line, and you wait 10 minutes for that. Now we got 40 minutes gone. You run by your room, and you're starting to warn people, and your wife says, what did you mean yesterday when you said such and such and so and so? And so you wait, and you have a 10-minute conversation about that. 
in that relation. Now we got 50 minutes gone. And, and, then, and then you round the corner and the, or, the orchestra is playing in the concert room and it's beautiful music and it gives you a break from the stress that you have. So 10 more minutes of this beautiful song calm you now, an hour is gone. You know how long the Titanic lasted? Less than three hours. And you may be thinking, come on, you're a really creative preacher, but that's ludicrous as an illustration. Let me ask you, is it really? Is that, this last week, what did you and I spend the most time concerned about enthralled with, entertained by, when our Savior said, go tell them the ship is sinking. <laughs> How many hours will we spend watching other people live out fake lives when we could be ministering to other people? Now you're starting to meddle, preacher. I'm preaching to myself. But the ship is sinking. I'm 59. My dad died at 71. If he's the benchmark, I only have 12 years. I may not have 12. What kind of urgency do you need about your own brevity of life or theirs? We aren't living in this plain of Shinar forever. Everyone on the planet since Adam and Eve sinned is here with an expiration date on them. Everyone. If it's not the big one when the whole world is going to end, and it is, it's going to be the individual one. All I'm asking is that you listen to the Spirit of God and you not be complacent. Do not let the devil whisper in your ear, see there, you may not even be a Christian because you don't witness enough. That's hooey. You're a Christian because you believe in Jesus. God's a patient God. He loves you very much. That's why he would draw near to you on Pentecost and go, Look, I messed up the world and then I brought them all together around the gospel. Look, I still want to bring the world together around the gospel. And everywhere you see Christians in the gospel feeding on it, thinking about it, sharing it and spreading it, Across cultures, they become families. Ask Pastor Dan to tell you stories of guys from in other countries that would otherwise be at odds with us calling him brother. <laughs> it's the gospel that brings us together and brings people salvation, so let's get excited about it. It's the greatest joy that we're going to have. I'm going to close with um, Barb Strackbine. Don't suppose you're going to meet her if you haven't already. Rob, you know her. You're nodding. She's a pastor's wife in Oklahoma City. They also served down in Puerto Rico. She was told umpteen years ago that she was going to die in six months of her leukemia, which is a, it's a terrible rare leukemia that plagues the red blood cells. Miraculously, God bless vitamin C therapy and then transfusions that are now down to every two or three days because it's gone for umpteen years. I got to stay in their house, you know, make, doing my travels to be at churches and do things. Bible verses on index cards all over the house. They raised five boys. Not all have stayed in the faith. Barb is a very quiet, unassuming, encouraging Christian woman. She's not flamboyant, but she's deep in God's word and she trusts it dearly. She understands it clearly and she shares it bravely. And her husband, Pastor John, was telling us about a text that she gave her family just a couple, three, four weeks ago. And I said, hey, send me that text. That's very encouraging. And I started thinking about the urgency of Pentecost and this world is sinking and I thought Barb would be a shining example of someone who left the captain's quarters on the Titanic and did what he was asked to do. So here's a text. She sent her boys and their wives and her friends you know, just a few weeks ago. And, and, and she's, in she's in grave physical pain and he health problem now. All the symptoms are, 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 are 
off the charts. This is not done in the comfort of a pastor's study preparing for a sermon. <laughs> Thank you, God, for remembering my name. This is all Barb. Does my favorite professor in college remember my name? Out of all the thousands of students he has had over the years, do I remember the names of all the children I babysat for in my youth? What was the name of the neighbor who lived on the east side of the Keels who raised sheep in the little town where I grew up? What were the names of my great-great-grandparents? I admit, I don't remember any of those names. But God, this is amazing. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him Psalm 8 but now this is what the Lord says he who created you O Jacob he who formed you O Israel fear not for I have redeemed you and I have called you by your name you are mine Jesus said I tell you whoever publicly acknowledges me before others the son of man will also acknowledge before the angels of God I will, never blot, I will never blot your name or that name of that person out of the book of life, but will acknowledge that name of that person before my Father and his angels. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation 20. Now, she's done quoting scripture. This is Barb again. So God is keeping track of everyone's name. Thank you, God, for remembering me as pure and holy because Jesus washed me clean with his blood shed on the cross. Lord, don't erase the names of any of my loved ones from the book of life so that I can be reunited with all of them in heaven. And then she says to her kids, I'm remembering you and your names, and I have hugs for you. Amen.